Hello everyone, I'm Lucy Fanger, CEO of On Technology Partners, and I'm proud to be sponsoring our new program, Women Stars. In each episode, we will spotlight an amazing woman and the struggles and triumphs that she has faced. Then we will reflect and share her insights. Our goal is to engage, entertain, and explore the women stars in our world today. I hope you enjoy. I want to thank all of you for listening today. My name is Shanti Harkness, and I'm the media manager for On Technology Partners, a woman-owned company addressing cybersecurity and risk. Join us as we share the reflections of women just like you that have survived struggles and embraced triumphs in their lives. Today, we'll be talking with Liz Farrow. Liz Farrow is an author whose works include Finish Line Feeling, Girls with Soul, A Girl Power Guide to Unleashing Your Inner Superhero, and the soon-to-be-released novel Chameleon Girl. As a child, Farrow experienced foster care and sexual abuse, but found solace in sports and fitness. The empowerment gained from sports led her to find the nonprofit organization Girls with Soul, which has received extensive national attention for its innovative and award-winning program curriculum. She's been featured on the NBC Today Show, in Self, Runner's World, and Family Circle Magazine. To date, Liz has completed 76 marathons, two 50K ultras, five Ironman triathlons, and countless road races and triathlons. She's completed a 26.2 marathon in all 50 states, as well as on the Great Wall of China. Liz, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So before we begin, tell us something that others may not know about you or something exciting about yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, that's subjective. <laughs> part anyway. Something that wasn't in there in the bio, I guess, was that I am completing a marathon on all seven continents. So uh, I have a few more left, but I've done four continents so far. And um, I was going to run in March on Antarctica, but they canceled it because of COVID. So I've been deferred to 2022. So I'm going to be running in Antarctica uh, next year and then finishing up with South America and Australia. And then I'll be done with all seven continents. That is amazing. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I'm excited about that because it, I mean, I'm not excited to go to Antarctica. I'm not a fan. I I am, but I'm not, I'm not a fan of cold, but what an experience, right? (laughs) Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Once in a lifetime for sure. Yeah. Same as the Great Wall. I mean, I don't know that I'll ever go back, but I'm so glad I went. It was pretty awesome. Sounds like it. Yeah. (laughs) I can't even imagine. It's considered the hardest marathon in the world because it's not just 26.2 miles. You also, in that 26.2 miles, have to climb um, over 5,000 vertical steps on the wall. So a lot of stair climbing and it's just brutal out there because there's no shade or anything. But every time it got really hard, it was just like, I'm on the Great Wall of China. I cannot complain. (laughs) Right? I mean, what an asshole I would be if I would complain on the Great Wall of China. So you just keep going. Amazing. Exciting stuff. I really love to try to combine traveling and new places that I've never been or I would not have ever gone to before with a marathon because the marathon is what gets me there. And I have been told, you know, you can go places without running, right? And I'm like, really? Who does that? So I'm kind of weird like that. that? I know. I don't know. (laughs) I'll let you know if I do that someday. (laughs) So to, to go right along with all of this, we know that triumphs don't come without their struggles, right? So talk to us a little bit about what some of your biggest struggles have been. This can be either professionally or personally. And how were you able to get through them? And what kind of an impact did they have on your life or career? Wow. It's all encompassing, I guess. My biggest struggles in life probably came early on in my uh, foster care time. You know, just I was born into Catholic charities. I guess they put me up for adoption and was moved between four different foster homes um, for a period of about two and a half years. So actually, my name at that time was Tammy, which is interesting that when I was adopted, my parents changed my name. But there was abuse that had occurred in all four of the foster homes. And then um, coming into a, my adoptive family, I sort of had issues, which I think would be 
quite similar to the ones you were talking about earlier with your feral cat. <laughs> Her name was Key, I think. Yes. Right? Not a lot of trust, a lot of angry outbursts, a lot of blood and tears. <laughs> you were mentioning that was pretty much me <laughs> for a long time. And my parents worked really hard on um, just, you know, establishing my trust and building myself uh, um, confidence and all that stuff. And it, it worked out really well. And I think in a way, my dad sort of invented Girls with Soul without knowing it because he put me in sports, just everything under the sun possible to burn me out because I had this crazy amount of energy. And when you're not using it in a positive way, it can be really bad. So they just wanted to make me tired, hoping that it would fizzle me out. I would have less outbursts and issues and so forth. So um, that was great until about nine and or eight or nine years old, my uh, next door neighbor started sexually abusing me. And that went on for on and off for a year. And it really just kind of tore me back down to another um, dark level that, you know, I almost like starting all over again, uh, except for the fact on top of it that my mom found out about it. That was a huge struggle in my mind because I didn't want anyone to know for a lot of different reasons. And when my mom reacted to the information that she found in an assignment pad in my room that I was writing stuff down in when I would try to get stuff out without telling anyone and I would hide it. And then my mom looked at it while I was at school. <laughs> so what moms do, they look through your shit while you're at school. Um, I did it to my kids too. So that's what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, she confronted me with it, but in a bad way, kind of, it was almost like she thought, first of all, if it was true, she wasn't sure if I was making it up, which during the seventies, you really couldn't know the things that I was writing about as an eight or a nine-year-old without having it happen to you. I mean, there was not, you know, access to porn or even a uh, Skinamax. I, we like to call it as a joke, but cinema, you know, like the type of stuff that kids could probably see now, we, we didn't have access to that stuff. So I don't know why she wouldn't think it was true, but she asked me that. And then she also said um, she wanted to know why I wrote it down. Was it that important to you that you wrote it down? And that's odd also in a way that it's like telling a kid that, they were proud of it or something like very odd reaction. And then the last thing was, we're not going to tell anybody because your dad will kill the guy and then he'll go to jail and it'll be your fault. Your dad's in jail. And she walked out of the room and never talked about it again, literally. Um, so it was like, okay, a nine-year-old again, I mean, I was a pretty scrappy kid already and I was tough and resilient in my own ways, but not equipped to handle that kind of stuff on my own. So you can imagine that my struggles just growing up. And then um, even especially into my 20s, you know, I think I had a really hard time in my 20s, because you're trying to be normal, but squash all this stuff down at the same time. And that's an impossible thing to do, to appear like everything's fine. So I used to have these like outbursts, my parents called them, and they were just like, where I would just kind of my anger would just come to the surface and it was like a freaking hurricane like you'd scare people <laughs> that were like what is happening because nobody understood where it was coming from so they just thought I was the bad kid the crazy kid and just you name it so obviously my struggles really just sort of kept going for a while and um, had to do a lot with shame and anger and self-hate and all these crazy things where I was trying to be a normal person on the outside, but I had a lot of inner turmoil on the inside. And if I hadn't had sports and fitness in my life, thankfully my dad introduced it and I held on to it because it was the one thing that made me feel normal and like I could accomplish something or I could actually be proud of my body, which like for a while I hated. It was just an amazing, almost like a superpower in its own right, you know, that would make me feel like a human. And I thought, holy crap, why am I not introducing this to other people who need help with that? But during the healing times, that was the one thing. I guess, during my struggles that every time I needed help, whether it was just a mental house cleaning type of thing, or I needed to get anger out or anxiety was just out the yin yang, you know, I needed something to help calm it down. Sports and fitness were always the answer to all of those things. So that's kind of what I would always go to, to get me through my struggles. And it's always helped. And every positive, good thing that's ever happened to me in my life, anything, you name it, it has something to do with athletic, sport, and fitness, oh, everything. 
That's wonderful that you've had those those outlets and that you were introduced to those at an early age to to help channel that energy and frustration and struggle and that you were able to use that in such a positive and and ultimately empowering manner to to better yourself and to to strengthen yourself like that that's wonderful yeah thank you <laughs> i'm glad cuz i wouldn't be here i seriously wouldn't be here <laughs> i shouldn't be here and it's because of girls with soul i know i was put on this planet and went through what i went through and figured it out on my own for it <laughs> it's wonderful so aside from the athletics and fitness did you have um or do you have any other tips or tricks or techniques that you use to help you get through difficult times you know the fitness and and all of that are probably my tips and tricks but i did yeah well i think i think it's really you know the title of my book is finish line feeling and when you think of the finish line you think of the end but in my mind it's like the beginning of what's possible so the finish line feeling for you or me or somebody else could all be different and it doesn't always have to be a physical actual race or you know fitness related finish line it could be work related or maybe like when i wrote my book and my first book and people told me first of all you'll never get published second of all who's going to want to read that, you know, like all of the different things that people will say to you when you want to achieve something. The the whole point is, I think, where the tips that I would give out is not to listen to naysayers and to go ahead and follow through with something that you don't think is possible. And then all of a sudden you make it possible. And then that spills out into all the other areas of your life and things that are difficult or challenging or scary become a little easier to deal with because you know that you accomplished X, Y, Z. So, you know, the fitness thing and the finish line feeling thing and all of that stuff doesn't always have to be physical. It could be anything. So I would say just don't listen to naysayers, move forward with what you think your passion is going to take you to, to a different place. And it probably will. Excellent tips. Thank you. Especially not listening to naysayers. It's yeah. hard not to especially if you're a little bit vulnerable to begin with. But I would say definitely don't. I mean, you can't even imagine how many people when I started Girls of Soul even told me not to do it. They said no one's going to want to be in the abused girls club. Those actual words were used, mm -hmm. which I think is crazy. Because <laughs> I mean, if you don't get it, you don't get it. And that's okay. But to say that no one wants to be part of that, and no one will support it is you know, ridiculous. But at the time I was like, wow, maybe, or, you know, somebody actually even said to me, who do you think you are to want to start something like that? And it's like, wow, <laughs> that's harsh. But if I hadn't, you know, done it, I figured if I, if I did start it and it quote unquote, didn't succeed, you know, by whoever's standards um, fizzled away or whatever, if I helped one kid, then that was successful. So I wasn't worried about it. And you know what? I think the bonus too was that I'd been called crazy my whole life. So when people told me I was crazy when I wanted to do these things, it didn't even save me. I'm like, dude, you don't even know. <laughs> so yeah, not listening to naysayers is is probably my biggest tip. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm definitely glad that you did not listen to the naysayers. And from what it sounds like, there's a lot of other women that, that would agree with that. So good job yeah, for listening to the really naysayers. <laughs> Let's take a moment and focus on some of your biggest triumphs so you can share what they were and what made them such a great triumph for you. Ooh, well, my kids are pretty good triumphs. They'd probably also really calm me down too. <laughs> <laughs> I think just the fact that, you know, like I said, I had some issues in my twenties where I literally thought I would be living under a bridge somewhere. Um, kind of the crazy lady shuffling through drug mart on Christmas Eve type of deal. Like I thought that was going to be me for sure. Just the fact that I was able to heal to the point where I would let somebody in, you know, like with marriage and all that stuff. Not that that's like, you know, the end all or anything like that. I've never looked at it like that, but I also thought I'd always be alone. So to me, it's a triumph to have a family because I never thought I would have one of my own. And then they're, you know, so they mean quite a lot to me in, in the fact that I don't know anybody that's like biologically related to me and except for my own kids. 
So they're, they're kind of my own triumph. Certainly, you know, in my mind, physical triumphs and, and physical strength is directly correlated to emotional strength. And you really gain both when you set a goal that's really scary, which is probably why I love trying to do all those Ironmans and stuff because they're scary. I mean, when you think about the unknown and you could be out there for 12 to 16 hours, it's a lot can happen and you have to rely on yourself to get through whatever does happen. So um, to me, those are huge triumphs and I'm super proud of those just because they're, I don't know, something that I thought I would never do. And that my dad, I remember watching the first Iron Man was televised like back in the eighties. And my dad and I were watching it. My dad since passed away, but I remember how we just thought it was like, so crazy, like insane. Like who would do that? And there was a woman, (laughs) poor woman, she gets, you know, first place wins the freaking Iron Man, and she's known for the person who pooped herself at the finish line, not for the person who won. You know, oh. it's like, like you know, like that's how she's remembered throughout history. But I remember as a kid, I was like, oh man, anything that makes you shit yourself, I'm, I'm there, I'm doing that. <laughs> like that was just like the ultimate. Like what? How could that happen? You know, like that's crazy. So just um, knowing that, you know, my dad thought that that was like not the pooping part, but the finishing part was something so amazing, and that that. I was, you know, his kid and I did it and I was just so proud of myself. I thought that was pretty cool. And I can carry it with me into, like I said, all areas of my life where I, I might doubt myself or feel scared or intimidated. And I'm like, I did an Iron Man. I can do this. So you really can use that stuff everywhere you go. And certainly Girls with Soul is like my greatest, probably accomplishment, my greatest triumph. Being able to help these kids find their way out of a dark place way quicker than I was able to um, is definitely, again, like I said, why I was put here. And it's a pretty big gift to be able to, to help them with that. So that's a big one. And, and the books are big too, just because, you know, people like to say, oh, you're not going to get published. And I've got three published books and I'm like, eh. <laughs> I'm the big goofball, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm not denying that, but somehow my books got published. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> well, somebody wants to read your story. I don't know. I think it's very helpful to people to feel like, you know, you gave voice to your story. It gives them permission to give voice to theirs. And um, it's not, you know, saying anything in a malicious way or in a, in a know-it-all sort of way. It's just a way of communicating your journey and other people are, are, I think, usually pretty happy to feel like they're not alone in theirs. So mm-hmm. if for no other reason, that's probably why they like to read them. That's probably why people like podcasts too, because they want to hear things that are like, hey, I've gone through that. And that's what I, you know, it makes them feel better. Maybe they can pick something up that they didn't think of to help their own lives. So hopefully that's why I wrote them. So <laughs> hopefully that's yeah. why the novel, not so much. That's, that's a whole different thing, but the other two are definitely hopefully going to reach people who I might not be able to reach otherwise. That's wonderful. Especially using, using your own, you know, personal struggles to, to strengthen yourself and to help strengthen other girls and, and women, you know, to, to let them know that just because something terrible has happened to you doesn't mean that your life is over or ruined, that you can still succeed and triumph and overcome, I think is so, so inspiring. We actually do an exercise called Just Because. And it's, um, it's a written one. And it says Just Because and then it, you're supposed to say two or three different things that you are. And then the Just Because is the things that you aren't. So just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I like to sew or cook or clean or whatever, right? Just because I'm whatever. So like some of my kids will say just because I'm in juvenile detention doesn't mean I'm a bad kid. It doesn't mean I'm um, a hood, uh, you know, a hood rat, whatever. And then you have to say something that you are. So it ends up being like, just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I like to shop. I am Um, an athlete, you know, like something that you wouldn't expect the person to say. And it's pretty amazing, like the self awareness when they start thinking of all the things like just because I'm here doesn't mean I can't be 
someplace else in the future, or I'm not, you know, just because I'm abused doesn't mean I'm weak. Um, I am lovable. You know, I am, a, I'm a whole human being. So it's really cool to hear all the different things that they hear that they come up with about themselves with the just, just all you asking them to say is just because, but it goes pretty far. I'm crazy, right? Absolutely. Sounds like a wonderful exercise. Absolutely. It's, it's fun. I like to hear what kids say. I make them read it and they have to stand up. And sometimes even just standing up and reading it is like enough to make them feel really awesome about themselves. <laughs> what age range of kids do you work with? We serve ages nine to 18. Certainly not ever at the same time, but you know, depending on where I partner um, with the program partners that I have, like could be a juvenile detention center or a school. And so if it's an eighth grade class, then that's the age range. If it's you, if it's a detention center, it's obviously usually a, you know, a high school level. So just depends on the partnership. So as women, you know, we, we juggle a multitude of things, career, family, household responsibilities. Sometimes there's illnesses and caregiving. How do you maintain a work-life balance and how do you find the support that you need to address all of those things? Um, I definitely make time on, I mean, literally I'm old school. I don't use my phone for my calendar. I have an actual planner. I really need it. I need to be able to see it in front of me and cross things out physically, (laughs) but I definitely put in my planner, you know, the time that I'm going to be at the gym. Or, and it, of course, they, there might be something here or there that makes me rearrange it. But for the most part, if it's in there and I have to schedule something else, I'm scheduling it around me first. So I think it's really important to do that because I'm not going to be as effective and my brain isn't going to work the way I want it to if I don't get that workout time in. And I definitely feel like it is very helpful to have a support system, like my, even my kids are very supportive of everything that I do, but my husband definitely is too. And it's probably also helpful that my kids aren't little anymore as far as being able to balance everything. Cause you know, that can overtake everything when they're mm-hmm. demanding of your time the entire time. Now they're both in their twenties and they're off at school. And, you know, I mean, they have their different types of needing me, but it's usually a text. <laughs> Not, not, not as time consuming as it used to be. So I got to say that that puts me in a little bit easier place to juggle my family time. But um, yeah, there, I think just really focusing on my own needs first, which sounds terrible, makes me a better person and a better, better mom and a, and a better spouse. So I really, I don't know if that's like, you know, the old, everybody always uses that silly cliche about your oxygen mask and stuff, but it, you know, you have to put it on yourself first and then help somebody else. But it's so true. If you're a dead battery, you're not going to be able to charge anybody else's battery. <laughs> so you know, it doesn't work that way. So I really do focus on you. And I think that that's something I learned over time, um, knowing that maybe in a way, like some of the uh, issues that I had worked in my favor, because if I didn't work out, I mean, I was a lunatic anyways, and if I didn't get a run in or something just to get some of that out and to feel a little bit more normal, I was really a lunatic. You did not want to even know me. So I think that in a way that sort of helped me instill that, you know, those principles into my life, <laughs> lifelong I've been doing it. So in a way, that's what we call in girls of soul lacing up for a lifetime of achievement. If you keep lacing up, showing up, working out staying strong in mind, body, and soul, you're going to achieve great things in life and it'll just keep going forever. And like you mentioned, it is often used as a cliche about taking care of yourself first, but it's, it's so true because if we are not taking care of ourselves, we're not in a position or we're not going to have the energy or the stamina or the mental capacity or the Mm. empathy to take care of others. And then then we're of no use to anybody, ourselves or others. And then Um, you beat yourself up too. And you just, it becomes a vicious cycle, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want to take care of yourself. And then you just keep spiraling down in a bad place. So you, I have to stay at a certain level in order to juggle everything. And that's how I do it. (laughs) Yeah. I think a lot of women feel, and, and I know I've struggled with this at different times too, is we feel guilty if we take time for ourselves, because yeah. every, everybody else needs us, but it's not selfish to take care of yourself. It's a necessity. 
Pretty much a necessity because that's all health related. And if you don't have your health, then you don't have anything, Absolutely. you know, and to me, I'm talking even mental health and physical health, but it's, it's all one. So you're really not going to be any good to anyone <laughs> if you don't have all that. I know. I believe me, I've had my share of mommy guilt and all of that stuff too. You know, even when the kids were little and if I put them in the babysitting room at the gym or whatever, I'd feel bad the whole time, you know, but I definitely was a better mom with a lot more patience if I went to the gym. <laughs> so, so it's all good. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent mommy without her workout. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to me, it's really more about strength. Like it's not like, I'm, you know, I'm in there because I need to fit a certain dress size or something like that. Like this is all like a, a it's 100%. It's part of like just maintaining of uh, my health and my ability to concentrate and not feel anxious. I mean, I don't want, I have little stubby nails because I bite them all the time because I have anxiety, but that's such a small thing to worry about can compared to how life would be if I wasn't taking care of me first. So we just, we actually call um, that in Girls with Soul, the power principles. And you're concentrating on the things that are going to make you powerful in life. And that's perseverance, optimism, wisdom, energy, and resilience. And those are all like super basic things that anybody could have, but you can also get them all through fitness and you can use them in all areas of your life. So if you have the power principles and you're, you're golden, as I, I try to it. focus on. <clears throat> I love that. That's excellent. It spells power too. Perseverance, awesome, wisdom, energy, and resilience. What a coincidence! Yeah. thing. <laughs> An excellent way to remember those. <laughs> so Liz, as a woman, how would you define success for yourself? And do you have any tips or habits that you use to help you to be successful? I really, for me being successful, I think I sort of even touched on it before when I said, if girls of soul, quote unquote, failed, if I helped one kid, then I was successful. I, if I feel happy and fulfilled, then I feel super successful and I want other people to feel that way too. So I guess that would be like the workbook, the girls with soul workbook, the, you know, the girl power guide to unleashing your inner superhero. That book concentrates a lot on self-awareness and it's really something that self-awareness, you know, it's almost like a catchphrase, but without it, you can't, understand your core values and set goals that are like specifically for you and understand what's motivating you, not somebody else telling you what motivates you <laughs> or telling you what you believe. Like, what are my true beliefs? Not what somebody told me I should believe. So these are all things that you really need to be successful, but they aren't things that you would normally really think about, you know, like, so I think forcing yourself to think about those things and then unleashing your power into the world. Once you realize all the things that you are truly passionate about, like fitness, girls with soul, reading, art, all these things. And now I can actually be like, wow, now I feel like a really empowered person. Now it's my duty to share that with other people. And so that's kind of, you know, what I think success is helping somebody else realize, you know, their own powers or their own self-awareness or their own happiness sharing it with them. I absolutely love that description of success. Thank you. <laughs> it, it is to me. I mean, 100%. Life is short, man. If you're not happy and passionate, I don't know, then maybe you just got to think more about what will make you happy and passionate and then you'll be successful. You can't lose if you follow, truly follow your own heart and your own passions. So, and share them with other people. Very important for sure. So let's take a moment and reflect on something that you wish you would have known sooner in life. Ooh, so many things. <laughs> so many. Mostly I think that this is probably like an abuse knee jerk reaction to having a, abuse in your life, but not knowing that people aren't judging you as harshly as you think they are actually my son and I were having this conversation the other day. People aren't even paying attention to you anymore these days. As you know, you think, oh, maybe I don't look good today or my outfit's dumb or whatever. 
but people are so wrapped up in themselves. They're not judging you like that, but in your mind, it could actually put a cloud over your head the whole day thinking that they are, but no one cares. <laughs> They're too worried about themselves. <laughs> So we were having this long conversation about that. I thought it was kind of funny because he's 22 and he's like, you know, you think your hair looks bad or something. No one cares what your hair looks like. <laughs> Why are you worried about it? <laughs> They're all looking at their phone anyway. <laughs> They're all looking at their phone and they're wrapped up in their own stuff and their own hair and their own Instagram and all that <laughs> stuff, right? So I really, but for a long time, I had a really hard time with that. Like I just uh, would beat myself up and I was my own worst enemy in terms of not being good enough and not being enough just in general. So I think if I could have somebody tell me that uh, nobody's judging you that harshly, you're, you're being harder on yourself than anyone else. That would be something that I wish that I, that I knew. And it's a goofy quote from John Lennon, but I like this one a lot. It's, um, everything is going to be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And it's kind of like one of those things like, oh, so true. I mean, the sun's still going to come up tomorrow. It's going to mm. be fine, you know, it, but you know, when you're younger and you really are hard on yourself or you, things aren't going your way or things aren't happening fast enough, everybody wants everything to be immediate. You know, you just got to give yourself a little time be a little kinder to yourself and patient because Shit'll happen. <laughs> I never thought it would to me. I'm I'm going to be 52. I'm just starting. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent advice. What advice would you give to young women beginning their careers? I think going back to what I said earlier with like really concentrating on your core values and, you know, your motivations, why you think you want the path that you're going down. Definitely following your heart in terms of being true to um, yourself and not, not letting people tell you you can't do what you want to do, that you won't succeed. Those are all really important things. Confidence and self-esteem are so like simple in a way but and basic, but they're difficult. Even though they're simple, they're tough to achieve. Yeah. So I think really just doing things that are going to build your self-esteem and your confidence and your courage. And I hate to be the person who beats a dead horse, but things that will help you be courageous is, you know, obviously doing things that might scare you a little bit because the more you do those things and the more uncomfortable you are in those situations, the more courageous you are the next time you're faced with something that makes you nervous and Physical goals <laughs> will definitely do that for a person. So, so maybe trying um, something new that they've never done before will help them master the things that they already love. Excellent pearls of wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing those. So Liz, if somebody wanted to get in contact with you, how would they get mm -hmm. in touch with you? Usually people reach out to me on Instagram, which is just at girls with soul and it's S O L E. So it's all one word, girls with soul, or uh, my email, liz at girlswithsoul.org. Thank you so much, Liz. It has been an absolute privilege speaking with you today. Thank you again so much for taking the time. Oh my gosh. Thanks for listening. I know I can be a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was absolutely wonderful. You definitely had a lot of, of wonderful stories and, and inspiration to share that I think our listeners will, will find great value in. So thank you again. Oh, thank you. On Technology Partners wants to thank you for joining us on this episode of Women Stars. If you would like to appear on a future podcast episode, or if you'd like to nominate a businesswoman to be interviewed for Women Stars, please email stars at ontechpartners.com. My name is Shanti Harkness. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you for joining us on today's journey. Remember, you are all women stars. If you wish to learn more about our Women Stars program or want to be a guest on our show, contact us at stars at ontechpartners.com. And thank you to On Technology Partners for helping me make this program a reality. Remember, we at On Technology Partners want to help you protect your team from hackers. To learn more about our cybersecurity services, go to ontechnologypartners.com.